see a third of the tone. There we see these mucous glands, the lingual glands associated with the posterior third, dipping down in between the bundles of skeletal muscles. We saw something like this in the pharynx. When we looked at the pharynx, we <coughs> remember that in the pharynx, you know, the constrictors really don't look like this. Okay, they're not running in this type of direction. All right, and there's not that fat. There we see um, the thing that is very indicative of the tongue. There are a lot of adipocytes, adipose tissue, scattered among between the muscle bundles. All right, we wouldn't see that in the pharynx. Maybe a little, but never to this extent. But there we see um, the evidence of a bit of the lingual tonsil. Okay? So if you go into the exam and you see that there is no, there are no papillae, lots of glandular tissue, a massive core of skeletal muscle, there is no capsule, no sorry, no heavy capsule that would distinguish this from the um, the palatine tonsil. Of course, palatine tonsil is mostly nearly, if not all, the bulk of it is lymphoid. It's just has a little lymphatic tissue. So Courtney, thank you very much. So there is one example of the posterior third of the tongue. All right, we didn't have very good signs of that. Now we move into the duodenum. All right. And um, here we see quite a nice slide of the duodenum right here. Okay. And we're seeing for the first time the presence now of, well, we saw it last time when we looked at pylor duodenal junction, which we will review. But there we see now the uh, good evidence here now of the villi. Okay. These tall motile structures, strands of the muscularis mucosae extending up into them. They're motile. These are your, this is now the duodenum that we're looking at. Now there's no other slide that you're really going to look at that looks like this, where there is this evidence here of a great amount of glands in the submucosa. Okay? So when we see this, these are the Brunner's glands. Okay. So we're going to start seeing now the test presence of villi, one. So in the duodenum we're going to encounter villi, these tall structures here with lamina propria. And I said very slender strands that you can't even hardly make out of muscular mucosa going up into them. Alright, so we see the mucosa here with these tall villi. With these. Then we see now the impress, um, evidence or we see these intestinal glands. These are the so-called crypts of Libercon. Okay? We see the intestinal glands. And then we see all of this here resting on the muscularis mucosae, which will be a part of the mucosa. Okay? So we trace these glands down to their base, and we see this smooth muscle in the base, and this is the muscularis mucosae. Okay? And then we encounter a layer below, and this is our submucosal <coughs> glands right here. So there we see the submucosal glands right here, and these are the glands of Brona, okay, or Brona's gland. And outside of this, we see the muscularis external with the usual outer longitudinal layer and the inner circular layer. And in between the two, we observe evidence of. Um, a, man, a plexus here, the man's air plexus, the orobax plexus. We see this orobax plexus in between the longitudinal and circular layers. Okay? Now the duodenum, as you know, is a retroperitoneal structure. Okay? For its most part, for the most part, um, we see that the duodenum is retro, sorry, the duodenum is retroperitoneal. So most of it basically has on it an adventitial. However, for example, the first part, the first 2.5 centimeters or so, we may encounter a lot of peritoneum. So there may be a serosa associated with parts, okay? But we find predominantly outside an adventitia, okay? So this is a good slide here of the duodenum, okay? So the duodenum there showing these villi, all right? So we can get these tall villi which are indicative of the duodenum and when we look now on the covering epithelium we're going to see for the first time the presence now of 
beautiful goblet cells. Okay? So these are the goblet cells right here. Okay? Alright? So interspersed among the covering epithelium of the, these are the tall columnar cells lining the villi are what are referred to as the goblet cells. There's a layer here um, that looks sort of birefringent right at the top here and outside of it there is a layer referred to as the so-called glycocalyx. But you'd have to use some special staining to stain about that but maybe you had this, um, read a little about this glycocalyx. But there basically are your tall columnar cells and interspersed among them, we see the goblet cells, the mucus secreting cells. Now, so when we leave, when we were in the stomach, there are mucus cells there, but no goblet cells per se, what we call the mucus neck cells, but there are no goblet cells. A feature now of the small and large intestine basically are the presence of goblet cells. And as you go down the intestinal tract, we will see that the number of goblet cells will increase. All right? And this is making sense because as we go down and we get into the colon, for example, and the colon now, one of the main functions, the, the fluid coming down tends to be very liquid, okay? But as we get into the colon now, we start to resolve water, okay? So therefore now, for the passage of the fecal mass, we therefore have now to produce a lot more mucus. So when we get into the colon, for example, and the rectum, we'll see that the pre predominance of goblet cells in the lining epithelium. Okay? There we can see some strands of the muscularis mucosae going up into the, uh, to the um, villi. Okay? So these are the strands here. Because these villi are motile structures. And we see a lot of goblet cells. From here now we dip down into the intestinal glands. So all along the intestines we get what are referred to as the um, the crypts of Librocon, the intestinal glands. And at the base of the, these intestinal glands are some very specialized cells. You could use a special staining reaction to stain them, and these are what are known as the panic cells. Okay? So at the base of these glands we find what are referred to as the panic cells. Then right juxtaposed to these panic cells here, we're seeing a duct for one of the major, that's a duct coming through right here, which is going to empty, and that's for one of the Bronner's glands. Alright? So there we see one of the Bronner's glands, the ducts of the Bronner's gland. So in the submucosa, the submucosa now is going to be occupied by these Bronner's glands. So, when we see the following features, we see one, villi, with, and we, we see goblet cells, because sometimes the stomach may give you the appearance of being sort of folded and appearing like villi. But what's going to distinguish it basically are goblet cells. Goblet cells are not really found in the stomach. And then now, we're going to see, together with the villi, we see these submucosal glands, these Bronner's glands. And that's going to tell us that duodenum. Alright? When we get down to the jejunum, we're going to use some opposite features. In the jejunum, for example, we're not going to see Bronner's glands, and what we will see in the ileum, which are lymphatics, we won't see there. Alright? So there we see now the inner circular layer of muscle right here. That's the inner circular layer. And there we see now what is referred to as Aurobax flexus. Okay. Now this slide is particularly interesting, all right, why? Because this has a bit of pancreas in there, not a bit, but a lot of pancreas. But we're not going to be looking at the pancreas today, but there is a lot of pancreas associated with this particular slide. Let's go down into a lower form, all right. So you know that the head of the pancreas lies in the concavity of the C-shaped part of the duodenum. So superior to the head of the pancreas.